on guys it's your boy luke here for our week 14 fades and sleeper picks as always this is the most important video of the week where we try and identify some of the diamonds in the rough to help you guys win some of those large field tournaments that are being low owned have really good projections and quite frankly should be core picks for most of the field and of course our fades the guys that i think of that are well too highly owned whether it's just bad narrative in play, bad projections by the community. Overall, I don't expect them to be as good of plays as the public thinks, and they will not be in my player pool. So with that being said, let's hop right into it here for this week's DFS strategy show. We'll start off with our fades for this week with DJ Moore of the Carolina Panthers. He's somebody who's getting a significant amount of ownership this week at 15.6%. And quite frankly, I don't really get it. This is somebody who hasn't quite looked like himself over the last month or so. A lot of that has had to do with them transitioning to Cam Newton at quarterback. It's not like Cam Newton can't throw the ball, but he's not known for his deep play accuracy um, or anything like that. You've seen a significant decrease in DJ Moore's usage rate in this offense. And as a result, a huge decrease in his fantasy production as well. And while the matchup against the Falcons is one of the best on the week, I think that's why we're seeing the ownership that we are. It's not really established that he's going to be able to take advantage of that upside. So for me at 15.6% ownership, there's definitely people in that price range. I think that not only have higher floors, but potentially higher upside as well. So he's not a priority for me and somebody I'll be fading because of that inflated ownership. The next fade will be Saquon Barkley, and much like a DJ Moore, has not quite looked like himself here in 2021. A lot of that has been due to injury and the giant struggles on offense, but it could be argued that he's not over either. He still doesn't look as explosive as he looked as a rookie coming onto the scene. And he's also dealing with an O-line that has holes all over the place, whether it's due to injury, inexperience, they can't really block crap. Uh, no flex seal on that O-line. You got leaks all over the place on it. So for me, against the LA Chargers, a team that has an underrated defense, not going to be somebody that I'm prioritizing. You definitely could say that the Chargers have a weak front seven. Their strength of that team is no doubt their secondary. But at the same time, it doesn't bode well for them passing the ball. And if they can't pass the ball over there in New York, they're not going to have much success on the ground because they're going to be playing from behind. They're not going to be in a positive game script. So for me, at 6.4% percent ownership that is well too high for Saquon Barkley especially considering that there are very nice pivot plays in this range one of which we will get to with our sleeper picks next up we have Antonio Gibson at the same price of six thousand dollars and also garnering over 17 percent ownership it's a very similar story here against the Cowboys um, arguably an even worse situation first off the Cowboys bigger favorites than the Chargers are over the Giants you're also dealing with a much better defense with the Cowboys they have an extremely stout front seven also a very solid back end of that team um, so overall I do expect the Cowboys to win this game and also in a relatively handed fashion so Antonio Gibson even though he does see a ton of carries and positive game strips I don't see that happening this week last week the game was extremely competitive week before that as well that's why he's been getting as many carries as he has but this is somebody who as soon as those targets start to drop off as soon as those carries start to hit the 10 to 15 range rather than the 15 to 20 range he ends up busting and busting in a big way they're, they're, they're a team that tends to shy away from running the ball, especially when they're playing from behind. I'm very quick to abandon that run game. And for me, at 17% ownership, that makes them an easy fade. And now for our sleepers. First off, we have Elijah Moore of the Jets. And I think this is the first time this year I've talked about a Jet player. I think I talked about Ty Johnson as a value pick before, but Elijah Moore's starting to look legit. He's starting to look like maybe the one bright spot for this Jets team. It's obviously a little bit early to be writing off Zach Wilson, but Elijah Moore over the last five weeks in the NFL has first of all the most receiving yards of any receiver and the most touchdowns. I think if I gave you that as a trivia question, you would have no chance of guessing Elijah Moore. Um, against the Saints, it's definitely a bad matchup. I mean, you have Marshawn Lattimore out there, PJ Williams, just a whole set of cornerbacks that can shut down receivers. But Elijah Moore has taken down better cornerbacks over these last four or five weeks, has had some of the worst matchups in the NFL, and has still been able to take advantage of them. So for me, at just 1.3% ownership, it's a joke when you compare him to DJ Moore. He's not only been two to three times more effective than DJ Moore over these last few weeks, um, the matchup isn't all that much different. Sure, the Saints are a top 10 passing defense in the NFL, but they still only let up 2.2 less fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers. It's not like we're dealing with a whole touchdown difference. And Elijah Moore is the clear alpha male wide receiver for the Jets now. He has surpassed Corey Davis on the depth chart, Jamison Crowder, all of them. This guy is getting 10 to 12 targets per game and in a relatively effective offense. People 
deservingly so were giving shit to them at the beginning of the year. They couldn't really score for the like of them. But towards the end of this year, have really started to find their way. Um, Mike White really had that first really good game for them. But Zach Wilson, since his return, has also been very effective. So I really like him against the Saints. This guy should clearly be 7 or even 8% owned. I'm going to be taking upwards of 15 to 20% just because we can get so much leverage there at 1.3%. Next up, we have Chubba Hubbard. He's a great pivot off of those two fades we talked about in Saquon Barkley and Antonio Gibson. He's only $100 cheaper. He's coming in with arguably the same type of talent level as these two guys. Um, Chubba Hubbard, he hasn't had much time in the league. He's obviously a very young player, but when he's gone touches this year, he's been effective, averaging over four yards a carry. He's effective out of the backfield as a PPR type wide receiver. And sure, he doesn't have the same home run type of play um, that a Saquon Barkley has, but Saquon Barkley with knee injury is not Saquon Barkley that we know. At this point of their careers, with the injuries in play, Chubba Hubbard is arguably more upside than somebody like a Saquon Barkley, and he's playing for a better team and a better matchup here. This Falcons team has been extremely bad against the run to this point of the year. Um, they have been a little bit better against the pass than people want to give them credit for. Um, towards the beginning of the year, they were a bottom five unit. They have improved towards the end of the year, um, right around average now rather than bottom five. Where they haven't improved is against the run. They're getting down early and teams are running the crap out of them. So while Cam Newton definitely could be a TD vulture here, um, much like a Taysom Hill could be a TD vulture for somebody like an Alvin Kamara, he should still see plenty of touches. And if they end up winning this game, I like him in this offense rather than somebody like DJ Moore or some of those chalkier running backs for just $100 more. And really, the comparison just comes down to the ownership. At 2.1%, is he eight times less likely to succeed than a Saquon Barkley or an Antonio Gibson? The answer to that is obviously a no. So that's why he's a good pivot there and why he'll be in my player pool. But now finally at number one, Anytime you get Lamar Jackson at less than 5% ownership, he should be an automatic play. This is somebody who, regardless of the matchup, can go out there and smash. He's going to give you that rushing upside, obviously a passing upside as a quarterback. And the last time we saw him play against the Browns, particularly last year in 2020, he ate them alive, went for over 30 fantasy points. If you remember that comeback game where he had to go into the locker room, um, said he wasn't taking a shit, but he 100% was. Um, it was that game, and he absolutely tore them to shreds. So while these teams have been good defensively this year, this is supposed to be a relatively low-scoring game. Would you surpri be surprised if this divisional matchup ended up being a shootout? I, I sure as hell wouldn't. It happens once or twice a year. We saw it happen last year. So for me, the fact that he's coming in at sub-2% ownership, not even sub-5% ownership, is, is a joke. He's probably the best play on the slate as a result. So I was looking at trying to roster him right around 10 to 15% at the beginning of the week. Um, I wanted to get my fair share of him, but if he's going to come in at sub 5% ownership, he's going to be my highest owned player on the slate, 30, 40%. That's the kind of leverage where I really want to try and hammer at home because to be quite honest with you, you don't even need to use him in a stack. You can play him on his own because of that rushing upside. It's not like you have to put 30, 40% of your lineups into Raven stacks. You can put maybe five to 10% of them into snacks and then just play Lamar Jackson on his own in those other 20. We've seen plenty of lineups with naked quarterbacks win this year. And I think that this could be a very good situation to go ahead and roll that out, particularly at sub 2% ownership. That's all I've got for this week's fades and sleeper picks. Go ahead and let me know down in the comments, first of all, who your biggest fade for this week is, and of course your favorite sleeper pick. For me, you guys saw my top three options on each side. I think the play of the week is going to be Lamar Jackson. Sub 2% ownership just seems a little bit ridiculous, but go ahead and let me know down in the comments who you guys have. And as always, really appreciate you guys stopping by and enjoying the content. Make sure to like and subscribe if you guys haven't already. We're going to have plenty of NFL content coming throughout the rest of the year, whether it's our weekly live stream tomorrow morning, that'll be at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time, or all of our coverage for the showdown or main slates for next week. So make sure to stay tuned for all of that. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already so you guys don't miss when I upload all of that content. But until next time, good luck with all of your main slate lineups for this week, and let's get this cash.